<laughs> okay. okay. So um, I'll be talking about entropy, uh, something I'm very, I, I really like. And I'd, hopefully I'll be able to convey to you that entropy is ubiquitous, enigmatic, and essential. Uh, I've got to press it something here. And yeah, so entropy. So most of you all might have heard this phrase, entropy is a measure of disorder. And some of you might have seen this cartoon uh, where a little boy being scolded by his mother for keeping a messy room um, says, I blame it on entropy. And this is often called the messy room analogy. You might have also heard the phrase, entropy of the universe can only increase. So let me start with some famous quotations on entropy from various different fields. And I'll revisit the scientific ones in the course of the talk. So we start with Rudolf Clausius, who, who actually coined the word entropy. And he said, the entropy of a closed system, not in equilibrium, will tend to increase over time approaching a maximum value at equilibrium. Then there's a chemist called Gilbert Lewis, and he said, gain in entropy is nothing more nor less than loss of information. And the famous theoretical physicist and cosmologist Stephen Hawking said, the increase of disorder or entropy is what distinguishes the past from the future, giving a direction to time. As I said, I'll revisit this in more detail. But entropy is ubiquitous. It's not just in science. Let's look at a science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov. And he said, it will all stop someday. But not for billions of years, many billions, even the stars run down, you know, entropy must increase. It's also been used in the context of the Olympic Games. So Chris Cleaver, a writer and journalist said, I think there's something extremely beautiful about the Olympic ideal and its motto, swifter, higher, stronger. It celebrates everything which is the antithesis of death, dissolution, and entropy. It was, it's been used in art. Here's a painting with the caption entropy. It's been also used in religious discourses. So this is a Nigerian pastor who said that the sinful nature of man is the same in every generation. Man naturally moves towards entropy. We are driven towards the carnal, mundane, and mediocre. And in business management, whether you have a leadership title or not, you have the potential to either lead your organization beyond all expectations or inhibit its growth through entropy. So you see, entropy is ubiquitous, is the use of the word entropy. The second word that I had was that entropy is enigmatic. So these are two famous people, John von Neumann, who was a quantum physicist, and Claude Shannon, who was the founder of information theory. So when Shannon first proposed his famous formula for information, then von Neumann told him uh, that you should call it entropy for two reasons. And the second, first reason we'll come to later on, but the second reason is funny. He said, no one really knows what entropy is. So if you use this word, then you always have an advantage. There is also another entropy enigma, and that's got to do with black holes. And it's called the black hole entropy enigma, which we'll touch, up, touch on at the end. So what is entropy? Let us try to understand what entropy means in various contexts, starting with thermodynamics and statistical physics, where it originated, then moving on to classical information theory, and finally to quantum information theory, and ending up with the black hole entropy enigma. And let us see why it is essential. That was the third objective I used. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you will uh, realize why I chose this title. So a bit of history to start with. As I said, Rudolf Clausius coined the word entropy, and he is credited with making thermodynamics a science. And Albert Einstein said this about thermodynamics. He said that this, he, he thought that this was the only physical theory of universal content, which will never be overthrown. So Clausius formulated the famous second law of thermodynamics which in a nutshell says that the entropy of a closed system always increases. And we'll revisit this again. So what is entropy? Let us start with the familiar phrase that I had introduced. Entropy is a measure of disorder. And so to understand what this disorder means, we need to introduce certain concepts. And this is the, uh, the, these are the concepts of macrostates, microstates, and multiplicity. 
These were notions introduced by Ludwig Boltzmann, an Austrian physicist and philosopher, who was one of the founders of statistical mechanics. So what are they? So consider a hydrogen balloon. So macroscopic description of this is given by observable quantities like its pressure, its volume, and temperature. This defines its macro state. But the balloon has millions and millions of hydrogen molecules. These move and they collide with each other and bump against the wall. So a microscopic description of the balloon at any instant of time is given by the state of each individual molecule, which is specified by its position and its velocity. This is a one molecule, the next one molecule, etc. So these define its microstate. So there are, of course, a number of different microstates corresponding to a balloon with a given P, V, and T. So to a given macro state. That's what I've copied over to this slide. And all these microstates are equally likely. And so this number, the number of different microstates corresponding to a single macro state is called the multiplicity of the macro state. And we define it by the Greek symbol, capital omega. So the entropy of the balloon when it is in a given macro state was is given by this formula. K is a small constant called the Boltzmann constant, and it's a natural log of omega, and we denote it by the letter S. And this formula was introduced by Boltzmann. It's called the Boltzmann entropy. So the point is that some macro states have higher multiplicities than others. Let me look at a simple analogy, just as just an analogy. Let us consider three boxes. Each box has exactly four balls. So we can say, that the macro state of the first ball uh, box is four R, standing for four red. This is three red and one green, and two reds and two greens. So, as in, in, a, in an analogous manner, as previous to the previous slide, we can say that the number of micro states corresponding to the macro state here is just one, because there's only one way of arranging four red balls in this box. Whereas for this, there are you see four different choices because the green ball can be in four different places. And for this, there are six. So the multiplicity, which is the number of microstates, is, which is given by the letter omega, is one here, four here, and six there. So let's now use Boltzmann's formula to compute the entropies for these different micro, macro states. We will find that it is least in this case, because logarithm of one is zero, and it's highest in that case, and it takes an intermediate value here. So this directly tells us that there is some relation between multiplicity and entropy. So if you look back at the phrase, entropy is a measure of disorder, it gives us a way to interpret disorder. So disorder is related to multiplicity. Disorder in this case being the number of different choices. So the higher the disorder, higher the multiplicity, higher the entropy. This formula is actually engraved in the tombstone of Boltzmann. Now, what is the advantage of this logarithm? So you see, if you considered just fx, just omega instead of log omega, it is a rapidly increasing function. So omega, the multiplicity, is typically a huge number. Yeah? We saw the number of different microstates, for example, the, of the individual molecules in the balloon. And taking the logarithm makes it into a more tractable value. Okay, so let's go back to our first popular phrase, entropy is a measure of disorder. Then, as I just said, we can now understand it that higher the multiplicity, higher the disorder, higher the entropy. So if you look at these two glasses, one has liquid water, one has glass chips. If you just stare at it and try to figure out which has higher entropy, which is more disordered into our eyes, you might think it's a glass of ice chips. But that's wrong because it is a glass of liquid water, which is high entropy, because it's in the liquid state that the molecules of water have much more freedom to move around. So there are many more configurations corresponding to a given macro state. So this is uh, this is the one. It's not working. Uh, the glass of liquid water has higher entropy. Okay. Uh, what next, let's move on to the next popular phrase, entropy of the universe can only increase. This actually comes from the second law of thermodynamics, which in a nutshell says entropy of a closed system always increases. 
So let's see what a closed system is. So let's start with an open system that, as the word says, is a system which interacts with its surroundings, exchanges heat, matter, and this is the boundary of the system. For example, we have a cup of hot water, so it exchanges heat with its surroundings and molecules matter too, because molecules of water can escape in the form of water vapor. Okay, I didn't, I didn't do anything no, to no, do that. No. Okay, and a closed system on the other hand is one which does not uh, exchange anything, does not interact with the surroundings. For example, thermal flask. So the second law of thermodynamics pertains to the change of entropy denoted by delta S of a closed system under a spontaneous process. That is a process occurring without outside intervention. So it says that the change of entropy can never uh, is always non-negative. So let me uh, explain the second law of thermodynamics through a simple illustration. So consider a container with two compartments containing two different gases. So that's the red gas and the blue gas. So don't confuse it with what we saw before where we were counting the number of balls. Here we are only interested in the movement of these red and blue balls corresponding to two different gases. So if you, the divider between the two compartments is removed. At that instant, this is what it looks like. You have red molecules to the left and the blue molecules to the right. But as the system is left to evolve, these the blue and red molecules of the two gases will mix freely. So the system moves from an ordered macro state in the sense of red to the left and blue to the right to, to a disordered micro state where all the red and blue molecules are moving freely with, um, among themselves. So let's call this the macro state A and let's call this the macro state B. So why does this transition take place? There are, the transition takes place because there are many more ways in which the red and blue molecules can spread themselves over the whole container. So to be in this macro state B, there are many, many more microstates corresponding to it. So hence, there are many more microstates corresponding to the macrostate B. So let us denote the entropy of the macrostate A by S of A and that of B by S of B. So because of this, we can then figure, understand that S of B has higher, is high, larger than S of A because this is a state with higher entropy. So the change in entropy, which is delta S, is therefore positive. And so what we see is entropy increases, or at least entropy can never decrease. Also note that this mixing of the two gases is an irreversible process. The gases cannot unmix themselves. So the second law of thermodynamics and says entropy of a closed system always increases. This is a fundamental law of nature. So example, if you consider a thermos uh, flask and you say take some ice cubes and a heated rod and put it in the thermos flask. So what would happen, the heat from the rod would melt the ice cubes and that would mean going to a state of higher entropy because you're going from the solid state of the um, ice cubes to a liquid state which we know has higher entropy. So this is the example of a closed system whose entropy is increasing. So Arthur Eddington, the astronomer, said the law that entropy always increases holds a supreme position among the laws of nature. Now we can understand the last popular phrase, entropy of the universe can only increase. How can we understand it? Well, the universe is the ultimate example of a closed system. There is nothing outside it with which it can interact. So its entropy must increase. So second law of thermodynamics and the arrow of time. So we know time is asymmetric. The past is distinctly different from the future. An, an egg breaks, but can't unbreak itself. Waves crash and we all get older. Why? So Stephen Hawking said this, this is actually a quotation taken from his famous book, The Brief History of Time, says that the increase of disorder or entropy is what distinguishes the past from the future, giving a direction to time. What does that mean? It means that if you were to reverse time, you would violate the second law of thermodynamics. If you can, could unbreak this egg, then you would go from a state of higher entropy to lower entropy, which would reverse, which would violate the second law of thermodynamics. 
And strangely enough, most other laws of physics do not have a direction, but this has a direction. And this gives the arrow of time. Okay, let's move on to entropy and information theory. So let's start with classical information theory. This is the mathematical theory of storage, transmission, and processing of information. And the field was born in 1948. There was a seminal paper written by Claude Shannon called the Mathematical Theory of Communication. So the fundamental unit of information theory is a bit, as you all know. It takes two values, zero and one, and all the data stored and transmitted in all the digital devices we used is encoded as bits. So he, in that paper, posed two questions. And the answer to those two questions were two theorems which led to this whole field. The first question is what is the limit to which information can be reliably compressed? So reliably means so that you can later decompress it to find what the original information was to high accuracy. And the relevance of this information, of this question is clear to everybody because we all use digital devices and we know that there is a physical limit to storage. The second question is what is the maximum amount of information that can be transmitted reliably per use of a communications channel? So this is also very relevant. You know that communication channels are inherently noisy. At some point in your life, I'm sure each one of you have spoken over a crackling telephone line. So the, the fact is, what is the maximum amount of information that can be transmitted? So for example, here is Alice say, picks up the phone and says, I will arrive at 11. And uh, Bob hears, I will die at seven. So what happens is that noise distorts the message or the information. So what is information? You read some news, you talk to somebody, you get a text message, these are all receiving information. But we want a mathematical theory of information. So what did Shannon do? He related information to the notion of uncertainty, or rather gain informa in information to a decrease in uncertainty. Yeah? You'll see an example of this. So a measure of information is provided by a measure of uncertainty. Shannon's measure of uncertainty of an event, he called the surprisal of an event, a name which I'm really fond of, and you'll see why, what it means. So to understand this, let us do the following. Let us just take two dice, a red one and a green one, and I roll the dice, and all I'm going to do is uh, find what the sum of the dots on the top face of the two dice are. And let X be a random variable whose value is this sum, okay? So I've just written a table. These are the all possible values that this sum, this X can take. It can take a value two to the value 12, et cetera. So these are the possible values of X, two to 12. And they have different probabilities. For example, probability that X equal to two, let's call it P sub two. There are 36 values altogether and it's only one choice which gives two. So it's one over 36. And in, in contrast for the value seven, there are five different, uh, six different choices. So you get six over 36. So then Shannon defined the surprisal of the event x equal to i for any of these i's to be minus the logarithm of the probability of that event. We take logarithm to base two because we are doing information theory. So bits take two values, zero and one. That's the reason. So this is the plot of the surprisal. So here the red dot corresponds to the surprisal of the value being two and the blue dot, the surprisal of the value being seven. And as you see in the plot, uh, the surprisal of two is greater than the surprisal of seven. So the idea behind this is that rarer an event, the more surprised you are when it happens. That's why the name surprisal. So rarer an event, higher its surprisal, and higher the information gain when it occurs. So let me explain the last implication. So supposedly in 1938, fishermen, some fishermen caught a coelacan, which is a prehistoric fish, which was believed to be extinct. So this is of course a highly unlikely event. And it led, so this was an event with a huge surprise. And it led to a huge gain in information because it led to a significant change in our understanding of evolution because this was a fish which was believed to be extinct. In contrast, the likely event of catching a trout would hardly lead to change in any theory, right? So surprisal of an event is a good measure of the gain in information when the event occurs. 
So entropy in classical information theory, which is called Shannon entropy after Shannon who discovered it or who introduced it is the average surprisal. So in this example of the rolling of two dice, the surprisal of the X being a value I was given like this and Shannon entropy H of X is just the it, it's expectation value, which is the probability times the surprise, which turns out to be this expression. So there is a relationship between Shannon entropy and the Boltzmann entropy that we just saw. So this is the Shannon entropy, and this was the Boltzmann entropy. And actually, modulo that constant, you can write it in a very similar manner. What is PI on the right hand column? PI is the probability of the ith microstate corresponding to a given macrostate. And as I said, all the microstates are equally likely. So the PI is one over omega. If you just substitute that, you'll get the first line. So you see, now we understand by von, why von Neumann told Shannon that you should call your quantity entropy because it is already used in statistical mechanics. You know? So this is the relation between the two entities. There is another interpretation of Shannon entropy. Let's play a simple game. I pick letters A to H. In, uh, from a Scrabble game and put them in a bag. And I ask you to pick a letter from A to H. And I have to guess which letter you have picked by asking you questions, but there is a constraint that you can only answer yes or no to my questions. So before starting the game, let's do a little something. Let's note that, of course, you're equally likely to pick any of the letters. So the probability of picking them is one eighth. And let's call P1 to P8 the probabilities of picking the letters A up to H. They are all equal to 1 8th. So we can just compute the Shannon entropy of X. What is X now? X is the random variable, which can be either A, B, C up to H. The Shannon entropy, we use the formula, put this in, and you see that the answer is 3. Okay, keep that at the back of your mind. And now we start the game. So I, you picked a letter. I ask you, is it in A, B, C, D, or is it in E, F, G, H? And if your answer is yes, then I, or answer can be no. If it's yes, then I say, is it an AB? If it is yes or no, and then is it A? If not, you know, it's A or B for sure. And similarly, you proceed with every other branch in a similar manner. So the average number of questions I need to ask in order to guess your letter correctly on each branch is see how many questions I've asked, one, two, and three turns out to be three. And this is not a coincidence. This is the Shannon entropy is equal to the Shannon entropy we saw in the previous slide. So this is called a binary search because each time you are dividing the set into two halves and Shannon entropy is the average number of yes or no questions that you need to ask in a binary search algorithm. So Shannon entropy of a random variable is a measure of its uncertainty, a measure of the information gained on average when you learn its value. However, there are many other entropies. I won't introduce them, just there's some names, Rennie entropy, Salis entropy, there are whole families of them. So what is special about the Shannon entropy? It has an important meaning in classical information. It is the answer to Shannon's first question. So this was Shannon's first question, right? What is the limit to which information can be reliably compressed? So this limit, you know, to which it can be compressed so that you can later recover it is called the data compression limit. And this turns out to be given by the Shannon entropy of the information source, which is producing the information. So to understand what is meant by data compression, let us consider a simple example. So let us consider four horses that are taking part in a race. So the information of interest is which horse wins. So let us label the horses A, B, C, D. And of course, we want to store these labels. I want to transmit to you, you're in London, say, which horse has won, and all um, information is stored in bits. So if you see a zero, zero, you would know A has won. If you get a one, zero, that you know C has won, et cetera. Yeah, you use two bits to store the labels. So yeah, I'm not done, done any, I haven't done any compression yet. So two bits are needed to specify the winner of each race, race without compression. Okay, but there's something we are overlooking. Horses have different speeds, right? There are some horses run faster than others. And suppose A runs faster than B, who runs faster than C, and D and C have similar speeds. 
So A is the fastest horse, so A is most likely to win. Now suppose a gambler wants to look at the data of all races in the past three years in which these horses participated in order to play places bet. So the winners of successive races would be something like this. You see A is occurring more frequently than the others because A is most likely to win. So the question is, can I use this information, this extra information that some horses are faster than the others to compress the information in fewer than two bits? So let's do that. So the probability of winning, let's give, assign them some probability. Say A wins with probability half, B a quarter, and the others are eight. So now what we can do, we can be a bit cleverer. And instead of just storing each uh, a label in two bits, we can use a single bit, zero, to denote A, one zero for B, and these three bits to denote C and D. And suppose now the result of seven successive races comes out as this bit string. You can immediately know without any error who the winners are. So you see, zero means A, zero means A, one zero is B, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so you haven't lost any information. But what have you gained? You have gained compression. Because let's see, let the average number of bits used per race. Let's calculate it. So let's um, uh, so you use one bit with probability half, two with a probability quarter, and three with probability one eighth. It comes out to be 1.7 bits. Whereas the Shannon entropy, if you call this probability P1, P2, P3, and P4, plug it into this formula, turns out to be exactly 1.75 bits. So you see, the average number of bits per race turns out to be the Shannon entropy. So what have we gained? We have gained compression. Previously, we used two bits, but now 1.75 bits suffices. And yet we have not lost any information. So, but what can, one can prove mathematically that if you use fewer bits on average, then there is some information which is irretrievably lost. So you can never go down below the Shannon entropy. Therefore, the data compression limit, well, this is a mathematical theorem. I've just given you an example. One can prove is given by the Shannon entropy of the source. There are also entropies of more than one random variable. For example, the conditional entropy. So let X and Y be two random variables and they are in general correlated. So let me give you a funny example. Let X correspond to the weather being sunny or rainy. And the Shannon entropy of X is then the uncertainty in the weather. Yeah? And let Y correspond to the place being Arizona or Scotland. So then H X given Y is the uncertainty in the weather when you know the place. So obviously this is less than H X because if you know what the uh, place is, you know more about the possible weather. If you know the place, the uncertainty of the weather is less because if Y is Scotland, then it's highly likely it's raining, right? Okay, if Y is Arizona, then it is highly likely it's sunny. So HX given Y is called the conditional entropy. Let me introduce one last entropy, entropy quantity. This is called the mutual information. So IXY, it is the information which is common between these two random variables. This is the amount of information you gain about X when you know Y, so, or vice versa. So let me tell you why I'm introducing this quantity. It actually appears in the answer to Shannon's second question. That is when we consider transmission of information over a noisy channel. So what happens, as we saw, noise distorts the message. And so all the time, all devices we are using they have built in error correcting codes. Yeah. So, but no matter how clever we are in, or Alice and Bob are in devising error correcting codes, there is a fundamental limit to which uh, information, to the rate at which information can be reliably transmitted, reliably in so that by Bob can recover the original message. If you have a channel in which no matter what you say, just spews out garbage, there's no way for, for Bob to know from the garbage what Alice was trying to say. So there is this fundamental physical limit. Okay, so one can characterize a channel by what's called its capacity, which is the maximum number of bits of message that can be transmitted reliably per use of the channel. And this turns out to be given in terms of this mutual information of the in input and output. And that's not, uh, not a surprise, right? If there was 
if this mutual information was zero, if Y had nothing to do with X, then getting Y, Bob cannot infer what X was. So this was Shannon's second question. What is the maximum amount of information that can be transmitted reliably per use of a communication channel? And the answer is the quantity is a capacity and it turns out to again be given by an entropic quantity, which is the mutual information. So classical information was built on two pillars. Shannon's answer to the first question, which pertained, which uh, concerned compression of information emitted by a source and answer to the second question, which uh, was dealt with transmission of information through a noisy channel. And these led to the mathematical theory, which uh, addresses questions like the ultimate physical limits of communication and information processing. Okay, let's move on to entropies in quantum information theory, which I work on now. So what is quantum information theory? So it is born out of classical information theory, which as you saw was the mathematical theory of storage transmission and processing of information, sorry. And quantum information theory uh, asks the question how these tasks can be accomplished using quantum mechanical systems. So I know there are quite a few people who are physicists in the audience. So, I, so you know what I'm going to talk about. So quantum information theory lies at the intersection of quantum mechanics and information theory. And for those who are not physicists, quantum mechanics is the fundamental theory of nature at the small scales and energy levels of atoms, subatomic particles, electron, photons, etc. At these uh, tiny scales, you know that Newton's um, classical mechanics doesn't work and it's taken over by quantum mechanics. It's counterintuitive and fascinating, and it has certain features which have no classical counterpart. So in quantum information theory, one asks what would happen if we use these quantum mechanical systems like an electron or a photon as information carrier. So you want to take your information and encode them in these systems. How well could information processing tasks be accomplished? So what are the ultimate physical limits to all these tasks when you harness the laws of quantum mechanics? So these are photos of a few of the founding fathers of the field, Peter Shor, Charlie Bennett, Alexander Holovo, Ben Schumacher. It's a really not an income, uh, it's a very incomplete list, but I just want to say that the ideas of quantum information theory actually we were sold way back by people like Feynman and Stratonovich. So the underlying quantum mechanics leads to distinctively new features, and these can be exploited to improve the performance of certain information processing tasks as well as accomplish tasks which are impossible in the classical realm. Okay, so let's start with a few basics. The basic unit of quantum information theory is called qubit, which comes from quantum bit. What is it? It is the state of a two level quantum mechanical system. For example, an electronic spin, which can be in an up spin or a down spin in any direction. Or say the polarization state of a photon, vertical or horizontal or right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized. So it's analogous to classical information theory. So we, as, just as the bit took a value zero and one, we say a, quant in, a qubit takes a value, this is called a ket, a zero or a one. It's actually a vector in a Hilbert space for mathematicians. So here, for example, the ket zero could really denote upspin and or the downspin and here, this we could use ket zero to denote this polarization as opposed to this. But there is a fundamental difference. A bit can either can only take the value zero or one. But in quantum mechanics, we've got something called superposition principle, which tells you that you can take superpositions. That means linear combinations of zeros and one are also allowed. So figuratively, if you have a superposition of these, you can get this thing, for example. Anyway, to learn anything about a quantum state, you need to measure. However, as soon as you measure a state, this is the state of the quantum system is disturbed. So if you measure the spin, it will collapse to either the upspin or the downspin. And there is also another very novel feature called entanglement. This is a novel type of correlation that can exist between quantum particles, which has no classical quantum. Part. So let us consider these two quantum particles by the green and blue blobs. And the dotted line around it shows that I'm interested in the joint state of these two particles. Now, if two quantum systems are in a state of entanglement, so if it is an entangled state, 
then when is it in an entangled state? It is an entangled state if it is impossible to describe the state of the green particle independently of the state of the black particle. Then you say that these two systems are in an entangled state. They can be in a partially entangled state, they can be in maximally entangled state. So let me explain the novelty of entanglement by considering the example of a maximally entangled state. So two qubits are in a state. When is it maximally entangled? When you have complete knowledge of the joint state of the two qubits, but you have no knowledge of the state of the individual system. So this is, of course, impossible in the classical realm. If you know everything about two systems, you know everything about the two individual systems too. So in this case, the entangled state is said to be maximally entangled, for which I call, use the acronym MES. And you measure entanglement in units, which are called EBITs, which is just the amount of entanglement in a maximally entangled state, two qubits. Okay. We not, you need not know the details now. So let's do a thought experiment to show, convey to you the novelty of entanglement. Suppose you have two in qubits in this maximally entangled state. And this Bob has one of them, and Alice has the other, and she's sent to Saturn. Okay. Then Alice decides to measure. Suppose these qubits are electronic spins. Suppose Alice decides to measure the spin, and she finds that it is an up spin. So, in a particular choice of the maximally entangled state, if this is true, then when Bob measures, he will surely get the outcome that his particle is in a downspin state. And on the contrary, if Alice got a downspin, Bob would get an upspin. So, observation here seems to be strangely affecting an observation far, far away across planets. Yeah? So, spins in, for this choice of maximally entangled states are anti correlated. So, Einstein didn't like this at all. He called this spooky action at a distance. But strangely, this spooky action as a distance turns out to be a valuable resource in quantum theory. Okay, to tell you uh, how it's valuable, before doing that, let me just introduce the notion of entropy in quantum information theory. So we are talking now about the entropy of the state of a quantum system, and it is the entropy is called von Neumann entropy. And I'll denote it by the letter S. So all these green blobs just denote the state of the system. And it was actually defined by von Neumann way before quantum information theory was discovered. And it quantifies the uncertainty of the state of the system. So if you know the state exactly, if you know that it is a spin pointing along this direction, then it's called a pure state. And then it's von Neumann entropy zero. You don't have any uncertainty. But the system can also be in a statistical mixture of pure states where there is uncertainty. And more the uncertainty, larger the von Neumann entropy of the state. So um, quantum, we, just as we saw Shannon entropy was a data compression limit for classical data compression, von Neumann entropy turns out to be the data compression limit for quantum data compression. So to talk about quantum data compression, I need to say what a quantum information source is. So a physical example of it is a highly attenuated laser in which the information carriers are these individual monochromatic photons. And let the green blob denote the state of the quantum information source, this laser. And S denotes its von Neumann entropy. So the Im information emitted by the source, one can show, can be reliably compressed into S qubits. Reliably means such that it can be later retrieved. Any attempt to compress the information into less than s qubits leads to information loss. And this was proved by Ben Schumacher in 1994, and it establishes the von Neumann entropy as the data compression limit, the minimum rate of data compression. But let me give you another interpretation of von Neumann entropy in the context of entanglement. But before doing so, let me tell you why entanglement is a valuable resource in quantum information theory. So it allows us to do tasks which used to be a matter of science fiction. What I'm referring to is quantum teleportation. Suppose we have this scenario. Alice has an unknown quantum state, say some photon in some unknown state, which she wants to send to Bob, who is far away. But she doesn't have any fiber optic cable or any way to transmit this quantum system. They only have mobile phones. 
So she has some quantum information she wants to send. The information is encoded in this qubit, say the photon, whose state she doesn't know. And she has no means to physically send the qubit to Bob. Alice and Bob only have access to telephones, so they have classical communication available. Question, can she achieve her goal? And the answer is yes, provided Alice and Bob share one EBIT of entanglement. Okay, so what happens is this. So EBIT means a maximally entangled state of two qubits. So suppose Alice and Bob initially share these two so that Alice has one qubit, Bob has one qubit, but they are in a maximally entangled state. What Alice can do, Alice has these two qubits now. She can do a measurement on her two qubits and then get the results, phone Bob, and Bob can do whatever he wants on his blue qubit. And at the end of this whole process, what happens is Alice still remain, has two qubits, but Bob's qubit has been magically transformed into the state that Alice wanted to send. So this is called quantum teleportation. Okay, so what we know from this is that EBITs are precious. <clears throat> Keeping this in mind, we can now find why von Neumann entropy is useful in the context of entanglement. So suppose Alice and Bob have a partially entangled state, not EBITs, but partially entangled. And we give them mobile phones and we give them many, many copies of this partially entangled state. And our aim is to extract EBITs from them. They are in two distant locations, so they are only allowed to act locally on their orange of purple bob blobs, and they can talk to each other classically. Why do they want to extract EBITs? Because then they can use the EBITs to do quantum teleportation, which is fantastic. So this is called entanglement distillation. And what we can find is the maximum number of EBITs that can be obtained per copy of the initial partially entangled state turns out to be the von Neumann entropy of the individual local state. So that's an operational interpretation of the von Neumann entropy in the context of entanglement. So these entropies, there are, there's a von Neumann entropy. One can also define a quantum conditional entropy and a quantum mutual information. And these all arise from a single parent quantity, which is called the quantum relative entropy. Here, the orange and purple are the quant denote, this is the quantum relative entropy of two quantum states. Now, this is quantity itself has a very interesting meaning operationally. It arises in state discrimination. So suppose you're given a black box and you're told the blocks box contains a state, uh, a ball, which is either the purple one or the state orange one. And you have to do a measurement to find which of the two quantum states it is in. Of course, you can make an error, right? You can think it is the orange one when it's actually the purple or vice versa. Of course, I'm doing everything schematically. So more distinguishable the states, less the chance of an error. So if you had a red and a black ball, they are more distinguishable than two balls, which are close shades of green. And so this quantum relative entropy that I defined is a measure of distinguishability of the two quantum states in the black box. So for example, it's this is greater than. So talking about parent and children entropies, there are actually various other families of entropies. There is something called the alpha pets relative ready entropy for which I use this acronym. There is also called the alpha sandwiched relative ready entropies. And um, this is actually not one family because alpha is a parameter which takes any positive value. So there are whole families of these entropies. Okay, so what am I heading towards? I'm heading towards the entropy zoo. So this is the relative entropy I talked about. These are two relative entropies I defined in 2008. And here are the two other parent entropies. So in 2016, with my fantastically funny and interesting Belgian co-author, uh, collaborator, Koenrad Audenat, what we did was define a grand parent entropy. So from all the three parents that we have can be obtained from this entropy. So it has, and which then has its own children. What was the point of this? The point of this is by defining the grand parent entropy, we could find a unified mathematical framework to deal with all the entropies which arise in all these different branches and problems in quantum information theory. And we called it the alpha Z relative ready entropy to convey its all encompassing nature, A to Z. And I'll tell you right at the end why I chose this name. 
Uh, there's a funny story about it, but after the scientific part of the talk, which I'm almost done with. So this is the alpha Z relative ready entropy and the whole zoo stems from it. And all of these have various different interesting operational uh, significances in information theory, in cryptography, quantum key distribution, etc. So just before I end the talk, let us step out into outer space and encounter a black hole, albeit from a distance, otherwise it will swallow us. And let's visit the black hole entropy enigma. So I know that there are particle physicists here. I know very little about black holes. This is something I learned from my colleagues. So a black hole is a huge amount of matter packed into a very small area. In NASA science, they say, think of a star 10 times more massive than the sun squeezed into a sphere, approximately the diameter of New York City. What is the result? The result is the gravitation field so strong that nothing, not even light can escape. So the surface of a black hole is its event horizon, and it is the boundary beyond which nothing can escape. And Stephen Hawking has this very famous area theorem, which he proved, says that the area of the event horizon of a black hole can never decrease. Take a second, this must immediately ring a bell, remind you of something I started my lecture with. It is reminiscent of the second law of thermodynamics, which says the entropy of a closed system can never decrease. So this is the black hole entropy enigma. John Wheeler asked a question to his uh, graduate student, Jakob Beckenstein. So he says, let's take a hot cup of tea. We know a hot cup of tea has entropy, right? It is in the liquid state of matter. A black hole on the other, has, on other hand has believed to have no entropy. So this comes from defined by Einstein from the general theory of relativity. And it is believed to be uh, defined entirely in terms of macroscopic quantity, like its mass, its charge, et cetera, angular momentum. So he asked, what would happen if I throw the cup of tea into the black hole? So initially the entropy of the system is the entropy of the cup of tea. But after the tea has fallen into the black hole, the black hole has swallowed the cup of tea. So you're only left with the black hole and the black hole has zero entropy. So the afterward, the total entropy is zero because only the black hole is left. So has the second law of thermodynamics been violated? So Jacob, uh, Jacob Beckenstein's answer was that the black hole must have an entropy. And this entropy must be proportional to the area of the event horizon. So he said that the increase in entropy of the black hole after absorbing the cup of tea would compensate the decrease of entropy in the rest of the universe due to the disappearance of the cup of tea. And his insight was based on Hawking's area theorem, among other things. And later, Hawking derived a formula for the entropy of the black hole. So hopefully I've conveyed to you that this fascinating quantity called entropy is ubiquitous, enigmatic, and essential. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Are there any questions? Well, or comments or, or comments. remarks? <laughs> So you mentioned these different ways of defining entropies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so are they all somehow equivalent or like? Uh, no, the, the two entropies that I defined, that the yeah, Boltzmann entropy is yeah. equivalent to uh, the uh, Shannon entropy. But um, there is uh, another class, the whole family of entropies. One is called uh, the von Neumann entropy. In fact, let's start. This is called the Rennie entropy. And uh, uh, for a parameter alpha, say alpha um, positive, and it is defined by uh, log trace rho to the alpha one over one minus alpha. So it's defined like this. And so this looks very different from the von Neumann entropy, which we found is minus trace of rho log rho. Here we are doing functional calculus to define the rho is a density matrix, so we are defining using function calculus. They look very different, but one can prove mathematically that if you take the limit alpha going to one, it goes to this. But it's not just alpha equal to one, which is of importance. There are other alpha values, which also have interesting operational implications. So since you don't have question, let me tell you the story of the alpha zero identity. So as I said, I grew up in a small town in, in India. 
But in that small town already, there was one Armenian. You know, um, uh, the Armenians after the Turkish attacks spread all over the world. And we had this wonderful Armenian and who had a very long name. And the first letter was A and the last letter was Z. So we could, called him Uncle A to Z. And uh, so when we wrote this paper, we had, you know, you give um, acknowledgements. So it was dedicated to this Uncle A to Z. I don't even know whether he's still alive. <laughs> but that's what made me think of Alpha Z. Thank you. So you spoke about how the direction of time is somehow intrinsically linked to second law of thermodynamics. Right, yeah, and the increased benefits. Yeah. So the second law of thermodynamics is as even as Einstein said, is the one law which will never be overthrown. Yeah. And uh, so people might you might just be philosophical and ask, why is time asymmetric? And Hawking's answer to that was, and Eddington's answer to that was, if time wasn't asymmetric, then if we could become, uh, take the example of an egg, if we could unbreak an egg, we would be violating the second law of thermodynamics. So going from more entropy to less entropy. And that cannot ever be possible. So the second law of time and thermodynamics tells you that the progression should always be towards increasing entropy. So it gives you a direction, unlike most other those are things. And so in my mind, the direction of time is somehow linked to cause and effect. In fact, it's been standard of cause, or at least it's seen kind of is, is that notion somehow connected to entropy? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yes, one talks about quantum causal models. Yeah, or not even quantum. Um, the causality principle always has to be valid. Yeah, but I'm looking at it from different lens. I'm looking at, we are looking at it from entropy. One of the reasons, yes, cause, there is cause and there's an effect and that is causality. But if this wasn't there, one of the main established laws of physics would be violated, which is the second law. But of course, I don't disagree with you. And it is true that I talked about more information theory in physics, but I'd like to tell you that um, I'm, I'm more of a mathematician. We work on the mathematical aspects of these entities and they are absolutely fascinating. And so um, there, all these things I've talked about data compression and data transmission, but underlying all of this, uh, if you look at how people prove these theorems, which I said in very simple terms, is one always consider, for example, a source that you're using the source infinite number of times. And each time you use the source, it behaves identically. So, so that you can classically represent everything by IID, independent, identically distributed random value. So these are memoryless sources, memoryless channels. And every, because maths is easier in the limit. But of course, we, when you want to go to a lab, you don't want to use a source. You want to source, use the source one time or five, five times. So my main focus of research has been on looking at information theory where you are lifting these uh, mathematically convenient but physically unmeaningful constraints of having memoryless sources and channels and reusing everything infinite number of times. And what one finds there is one defines in, in, that, in, in that zoo of entropies, the two big ones I defined was because there one finds new families of entropies satisfying very interesting mathematical properties, which replace the Shannon entropy and the other entropies we talked about but converge to them if we allow these memoryless infinite as asymptotic scenarios. Yeah, yeah. so uh, the whole important, that's a very good question because entropy can never decrease for a closed system. But if you just consider the entropy of a system, which is then interacting with its surroundings, you can get the entropy to increase. But if it's it's only for a closed system, that's why for a universe, it can never increase. No, no, no. If, if you consider that, then you have to consider all what you're doing too. So you have to count all the contributions to the entropy. But if you are considering a system here, looking at it from outside, you're doing something, you can make its entropy decrease because you're interacting with it. But if you consider yourself to be all in a closed system, can't count all contributions to the entropy, it can never decrease. So, the little boy could tidy up the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson, 
yeah yeah but, but she would be his totally dirty exactly room. so that's the dirty messy room analogy yeah yeah so so yeah this that's got nothing to do with quantum mechanics yeah this arrow of time yeah yeah. Thermodynamics, where you have statistical mechanics coming in. Yeah, exactly. Because it is absolutely true, because you, you need the multiplicities to define disorder. The whole idea was, why do people get confused? What is disorder? What looks disordered? So the messy room analogy is actually a bad analogy, because it looks it looks uh, messy, but what looks messy to the eye need not be the one with higher entropy, as we saw with the two glasses, the glass of water as opposed to the glass with uh, frozen chips, uh, ice chips. So yes, it is not uh, the second law of thermodynamics emerges in the macroscopic scale of where there are multiple, you know, where the notion of multiplicity applies. So, so, somehow I don't know if it's kind of resistant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, mechanics, you have this uh, destroying state and sort of observation. Yeah. That seems very non uh, Yes, it is. Uh, but there are some quantum second laws of thermodynamics. But I am not in a position to go into them right now. But it is true that uh, when you measure something, you're destroying. It's collapsing, but that's not, we can't really assign an arrow of time to it because then you can do certain measurements in this um, where it preserves the state anyway. So that I would not relate it to the arrow of time. No. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say that. But I, I'm, I'm saying that the, I'm, not, I'm cannot talk about the. There are second. The, the time is asymmetry stems from the second law of thermodynamics, and there are versions of the second law of thermodynamics in quantum mechanics. But I don't know enough about them to talk about it. But yes, there is. What you're talking about is a causal model, yeah. And quantum causal causalities just as respected in quantum mechanics as it is in classical mechanics. Uh, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is uh, the asymmetry of time is has to be there because it's, it uh, otherwise the second law of thermodynamics would be violated in the classical level. We're talking about the classical universe, right? So, but I'm not talking about quantum causal models yet. This is actually one part of my ongoing research, but it's too much in its infancy to talk about it. Okay. Um, any more quick questions? If not, let's thank Nilanjana again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming online. I think there's some questions on chat. No, I think there's some questions. Okay, no problem. <laughs>